Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. I'm continuing my look at hauntings in Astoria, New York. And this episode, I'm excited to talk about what seems like maybe the most famous haunted house story in Astoria, at least when I was going through historic newspapers, this seemed like one of the big ones. And part of what makes this story interesting is that it actually involved the famous psychical researcher, Hereward Carrington. I'm not totally sure that I'm saying his first name right. It's spelled H-E-R-E-W-A-R-D. As you can probably guess from the name, he was English and Maybe there's some other way you're supposed to say his first name. But Carrington was the head of the American Psychical Research Institute. He was an author. He wrote something like a hundred books or more than a hundred books about paranormal stuff, psychical research stuff, stage magic, alternative medicine. I guess he was also a fruitarian and had some weird ideas about dieting. If you're interested, you can find more about that on his Wikipedia page. But I read an article in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle from July 11th, 1937, that had a little bit more background info about him. And the article did mention this Astoria haunting. And side note, this article, funnily enough, was printed right next to a huge advertisement for a chain of funeral homes in Brooklyn, which I found kind of morbidly funny. So this article had a really striking description of Carrington. It called him a keenly intent man with magnetic gray eyes and a shock of graying hair. It talks about how he leaned forward in his chair and revealed fascinating ghostly data. He believes in ghosts, though he has exposed as many fraudulent spirits as he has made friends with honest-to-goodness spooks in years of psychical research. It goes on to talk about how he's been doing a survey of haunted houses and, quote, The search for haunted houses gravitated Dr. Carrington towards Astoria some time ago, where he spent considerable time in the famous Ghost and Gold House. Even now, three years later, he is reluctant to speak much about that adventure. He is inclined to be modest about frauds he has shown up and more reticent to boast about the ghosts who are his friends. There is too much of this tongue-in-your-cheek attitude about ghostly things in this country, he feels. Whereas abroad, especially in his native England, the subject of psychic phenomena is taken seriously. The article goes on to say that Carrington was born in England, but went to the University of Iowa. He got interested in the paranormal because he got into amateur stage magic, and then that sort of led to paranormal stuff. He said that he was not a spiritualist and was just a normal person who liked to play bridge and tennis. And his interest in the paranormal came from sort of scientific inquiry an interest rather than emotional loss, like he wasn't motivated to reconnect with a dead loved one or something like that. Here's what he was quoted in this article to say about the paranormal. I don't believe there is any such thing as the supernatural. Rather, it is the supernormal. There are countless sources of nature that have not yet been discovered and every now and then give some indications of their being. In England, for instance, the subject of psychic phenomena is respectable. Groups study it at Oxford and Cambridge, but that is not so here. The article goes on to describe his philosophy. People who don't believe in ghosts, he admitted, are afraid of them. People who do believe are actually fond of their ghostly friends. At least they are interested in them. He will scoff down traditional ghost stories that crop up and point out how the power of suggestion has worked. I kind of agree with that, you know. There is kind of this sense that people who don't like the paranormal or say it's fake almost seem more superstitious or scared of it than people who are interested in the paranormal. That's a very general statement that I'm making, but, you know, I guess I can kind of see where he's coming from there. The article also says, No astronomical genius has ever seen Mars with the naked eye, yet science readily accepts Mars as something that actually exists. 
And then the article turns back to talk about the Astoria story. But that Astoria ghost story was just the old power of suggestion theory, Dr. Carrington revealed. A young Sicilian and his housekeeper, an elderly Irish woman, reported to Dr. Carrington that they had heard footsteps on the Astoria shack they wished to fix up for renting purposes. A woman tenant in the house was strangled one night in bed. The misty figure on the stairway appeared one night and admonished them. Don't be afraid. There's a fortune buried in the cellar. So the Sicilian man who is mentioned here, his last name was apparently Bascula, B-A-S-U-L-C-A. Or actually, I guess that's Basulka. At any rate, most of the articles don't give his name. They just say that he's Sicilian and that he used to own a beauty parlor. And also, side note, so the thing I just read mentioned that a woman was strangled. She did not die. But a New York Times article from 1934 mentions that she had fingerprints on her throat after the attempted strangulation. And the article also claims that the original owner of the house had supposedly strangled his daughter in the room where the boarder had lived. And I want to read a little bit from this New York Times article. This is more detail about this shadow person or ghost who told this Sicilian man that there was gold in the basement. One night, as the Italian beauty specialist lay asleep, something awakened him. Sitting on his bed was an indistinguishable shape, not the conventional ghost of fiction all draped in white, but something dark. He knew from its voice that it was the shade of the woman who had been murdered. Do not be afraid of me, it said. Go on with your digging. There will be no rest for me until you find what you seek. So I think it's interesting that this is sort of like a shadow person or something. I feel like you don't see that super often in these sorts of haunting stories from back in the day. Also, doesn't it sound like maybe this, if this shadowy ghost is the ghost of this woman who was supposedly murdered there, doesn't it sound like maybe her body could be buried in the basement? And that's why she couldn't rest until the treasure in the basement was found. This is just conjecture on my part, but if you were like a unsettled spirit who couldn't rest because your body was buried in your basement after your father murdered you, wouldn't you maybe like lie to the current tenant to try to get them to find your body? I mean, who knows, maybe there was gold, but like, I don't know why she wouldn't be able to rest till he found some gold, but who knows. So to go back to the Brooklyn Daily Eagle article I was reading from, it has a description of how the man dug a lot in his basement. He dug and dug so deep that the dirt completely filled the cellar. He struck a cement wall, broke through that, but found no treasure. Dr. Carrington brought three mediums to the scene and each one told of the buried treasure. Then the ghost story really became exciting. A big dog was picked up and thrown down one day and limped forever after. The elderly housekeeper was knocked down by the ghostly body. As events finally turned out, Dr. Carrington said, the ghost proved to be a myth. The building department made the young man stop digging. He eventually moved away and the house was done over, and there haven't been any tales of ghosts lately. I don't understand what done over means in this context, but I think it must mean examined, because according to tax records and photographs from 1940, looking at the address where this supposedly took place, the building that stood on this lot in 1940 had been there since 1908. So I don't think it could mean torn down. Also, the article doesn't explain why Carrington thought this story was fake. It doesn't refute any of the things that happened. It just ends with him saying, oh, it was the power of suggestion. And in some other places, Carrington said some things that made it seem like he thought maybe the haunting might be real, but he just didn't have enough information. So let's get into this story a little bit more. So this story supposedly takes place at 3035 31st Street in Astoria, New York. For those of you who don't live in the beautiful borough of Queens, the 30 in the beginning of the address, because it's written 30-35, 30 
31st Street. The 30 means that it's off of 30th Avenue. And then, of course, it's on 31st Street. So we're talking about a building in Astoria at 31st Street off of 30th Avenue. Today, the N and W trains run on an above ground track right on 31st Street, like it follows 31st Street up towards Dittmar's. And the elevated train was there back in the 1930s as well. One caveat I should mention, though, is there's some stuff that I saw that made it seem like either the descriptions of this house that was there were incorrect or the address was incorrect. But I'll talk more about why I think this address is probably correct and the descriptions were just made up. But in case you're wondering, the building that stood on 30-35, 31st Street, is no longer there, at least the building that stood there in 1940, because I found a tax photo from the 1939 to 1941 records of the building that used to be there. So the old building looks like it was two stories with a basement that had windows that start at the level of the sidewalk. There's a brick stoop of three steps that leads up to the front door. And the door looks really nice and cool. It's like a double door that opens in the center. It has windows inset in them and some nice octagonal molding. There's a driveway on the side with a garage behind it, which I suspect maybe held carriages or horses or something before cars were popular. And in the tax photo, there's a car parked out in front of the garage. The building is continually described as a shack or like a rundown frame house, but that's not what was there, at least at this address in the tax records. And it looks nice in the 1940 picture. So I think they likely added the details of it being run down to add to the ambiance of the ghost story. Nowadays on that lot, there's a decent sized apartment building there. It was constructed in 2006. I searched the address and found on Street Easy that you can currently rent a one bedroom apartment there for $1,700 a month with the first month free. Um, that's a pretty middle of the road price for the neighborhood these days, though it's cheap by New York City standards, I would say. I think the interior of the apartment is not the best looking. I bet the old house that was there looked a lot nicer on the inside. But you know, it's a big building. They allow pets. It could be uglier, you know? So that's what's there now. Let's go back to 1934 when this story took place or at least when the reporting about this story took place. One source that I used in addition to the newspaper articles I found was a book called New York City Ghost Stories, which was written by Charles J. Adams III and was published in 1996. It has a whole chapter on this story, and in his account, he seems to draw mostly from the New York Times articles about the hauntings. And I found two November 1934 articles, which I think are the two he used in, for the book. One of them is called Policeman's Quest for Ghosts Futile. Three carloads go to Astoria's haunting house only to get a cold reception. And the other one's called Gold Ghost Walks in Astoria House. The articles are written somewhat sensationally. They mention the dog that came up in the passage I read earlier. They say that it was a police dog. New York City Ghost Stories says it was a German Shepherd. So if anyone's curious, that's the likely breed of the dog. One of the New York Times articles describes the house as huddled in the growing dark like some sinister prehistoric monster, which is a very dramatic way of phrasing a description of the home. But I guess if you're trying to write a story and make it sound creepy, that's one way to do it. I also found part of that article paraphrased in a syndicated piece that was printed in the January 1st, 1940 issue of the Standard Speaker, which was a newspaper in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. And the reason why this 1940 article feels worth mentioning to me is that it basically is a rephrased version of these 1934 New York Times articles. It seems to take some liberties and it shows the sensationalism that crept into the story to make it interesting news copy. You know, it makes it sound all spooky and creepy. And after all, supposedly in 1937, from that Brooklyn Daily Eagle article I read earlier, Carrington 
disavowed the haunting. And here's a news service digging up the story again and embellishing it because it makes good copy. The article has lines like, In a certain street in the borough of Queens in the city of New York, there is a century-old house reputed to be haunted by poltergeists. The German name for ghosts with a mean disposition and a bad temper, spooks that would just as soon crown you with a flat iron as look at you. So first, I thought that was a funny description of poltergeist. Not inaccurate necessarily, but funny. Second, it says that the house is a century old, which if we're talking about the house that was in the tax record photo that I found is not correct because the tax records show that the building I was looking at was built in 1908. So in 1940, it would have only been 32 years old. So there's a discrepancy there. This article describes a reporter being sent to this house in Queens haunted by such totalitarian spooks. He arrived just at dusk. The setting was perfect for a ghost story. Sagging and weather-beaten, badly in need of paint, it huddled in the growing dark like some sinister prehistoric monster. The porch was warped, loose boards creaked under the tread. The bell sounded deep and hollow somewhere inside. The door opened about two inches and a gray old face, barely distinguishable in the old gloom and partly hidden by tangled gray hair, peered out. A big shepherd dog growled somewhere behind the old woman's skirt. When the reporter said he had come from Dr. Carrington, the door opened a little wider and he was admitted into a dark hall. No lights anywhere. He was led into the front room where furniture, oddly shaped and grotesque in deep shadow, seemed to crowd in upon him and the old woman. So, beautifully written, really evokes a sense of setting, though kind of the more beautifully something's written, the more likely I am to think it's highly embellished. So the old woman then begs the reporter not to use her name or mention the street name, which is kind of convenient because this description of the house doesn't match the actual house that was at 30, 35, 31st Street. So then the reporter asks the woman if the story about the haunting is true, and then the woman nods, quote, her old eyes wild with fear. Then basically it gets dark. She does doesn't turn on the lights still, and the reporter eventually leaves, and then the woman locks the door after him, but it's written in a way to sound really sinister and like something terrible has happened when really he basically visited and had a short conversation and left. So, like I said, there are a few things wrong with this story. One is that the building, based on the 1940 tax photo, looks like it's a sturdy brick building, like many buildings around here that were built around that time. It looks not unlike a building that I used to live in that was around here that was about the same size and built in the early 1910s. It has a brick exterior and it's in great condition today. Nothing's sagging because if it's brick, I guess brick maybe could be sagging like if bricks were missing, but seems kind of unlikely. That seems like a description of a wooden house. And then also the idea that it could be in need of paint. You don't really paint brick, at least not around here. And you would never look at a brick building and be like, you know, someone needs to paint that brick. Like that's something you would say about a wooden building where the paint's peeling off. Also, the tax photo shows a stoop, but no porch. So like I said, either the address I found in articles for this home is incorrect or the house's appearance was made up and or exaggerated for effect. And my guess is that the second is more likely. So the article also had a very dramatic description of what had happened in this haunted house. So, quote, The little old woman was going about her affairs on the lower floor of the house, her big German shepherd dog at her heels. All at once, something, something, lifted the dog six or seven feet in the air and slammed it back to the floor with terrible force. As it lay there whimpering, unable to get up, the old woman knelt down on her knees by its side. She found that both its hind legs were broken. Six weeks later, an invisible malevolence lifted the little old woman off her feet 
and violently hurled her to the floor, breaking her left arm and left leg. The article doesn't mention the Sicilian man at all, or the gold in the cellar, or other parts of the haunting that other articles mention, which again makes me think even more that this is sort of just an article where things have been picked and chosen from other articles, and it's mostly for entertainment. So to return to the 1934 New York Times articles that I was able to find, one of them describes three carloads of cops showing up at the house at 9 a.m. This also describes the house as an ancient mansion with a porch with sagging boards. And in the other New York Times 1934 article, the house was described as a 100-year-old frame house. So it's like a wooden house that would have been built in the 1830s. But basically, the cops said that they had read about the case in the newspaper and they had heard that the old woman had dug up the cellar. And New York City Ghost Stories claims, you know, that the cops visited not to investigate the ghost story, but because they did not have a permit to dig in the cellar. So the cops asked about the pit, which had supposedly been dug 20 feet deep and 10 feet wide, which is kind of wild, in the search for gold. The old woman denied everything and said there had been no ghost and Carrington had never visited. She said that she had had the hole dug to have a cool place to store vegetables during the summer. Seems like a lot of effort to go through to store some vegetables. Because 20 feet deep, I think that's like two stories deep, basically. That's really deep. So, you know, they went to the basement and, quote, encountered great mounds of earth that had been taken out of the pit. There were large boulders that had obviously been lifted out with back-breaking effort. And then finally, there was the pit itself, a deep yawning hole. All around the inner walls of it were huge planks, apparently used for shoring. Nearby was a pail and a shovel, as if the digging were either still in progress or only recently abandoned. So then it describes how the reporter, who had come along with the cops, quote, stopped dead in his tracks, startled. There's a man hanging from that beam, he said, pointing. So apparently, quote, the man was only a curious mannequin made of accordion tissue. No one explained that, not even the woman proprietor. She and the growling dog stayed upstairs. So I looked it up. Accordion tissue sounds like it's tissue paper. So I guess this is like a paper mache man who's just hanging from the beam of the basement ceiling. That's kind of weird and creepy. So then the cops continued going through the basement, and supposedly they encountered a tunnel. So to continue reading from the article, it was obviously of great antiquity. This, it is understood, was originally a passageway leading from the old house to a nearby church, which has long since been torn down. That detail's really interesting to me, because, okay, imagine there was supposedly gold hidden in your basement. Why don't you think it would be hidden in the already existing tunnel, not literally under the floor of the home, like under the basement floor? I would at least, but maybe that's just me. So the cops questioned the woman some more, and eventually she did admit that Carrington had visited, but she claimed that there were no ghosts. The cops then demanded that she have the hole filled in because it could damage the foundation of the house. When the New York Times contacted Carrington for a statement, he said that the American Psychical Research Institute had no connection to the investigation. He said it was a personal investigation that he undertook, and the way he said it made it sound like the investigation had maybe happened a while before, maybe even years before, though it's a little unclear. But that's kind of interesting. Seems like maybe the story took a while to get out. But Carrington basically then said that he wasn't able to do a proper investigation because the owners wanted it to be conducted under absolute secrecy. So it sounds like he wasn't able to confirm or deny the hauntings. He did mention that several mediums who he had brought, who hadn't been told about the supposed gold in the basement, all confirmed that there was supposedly gold buried beneath the house. But apparently Carrington and his wife had visited three times to investigate, and at least according to the New York Times, quote, nothing that occurred during the visits of the Carringtons indicated that the forces behind the tricks that disturbed the household 
were of human origin, they were unable to explain the happenings. Supposedly, Carrington had called in the mediums because he wanted to convince the old woman that there was no gold buried under the house, and he was not successful in that since all three mediums seemed to think that there was really gold. And supposedly the reason why Carrington was called in in the first place was the Sicilian man and the old woman had trouble finding boarders who wanted to live in their house because of this poltergeist type presence. Oh, and one thing I wanted to mention was this woman. Her first name was Anna. So it's Anna Sheehan. Not all of the articles give her name, but one of the articles that I found from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, which was published on November 22nd, 1934, the same date as several of the other articles, both gives Sheehan's first name, says Mrs. Anna Sheehan, but it also gives the address. So interestingly, this article gives the address, it gives the woman's full name, and it doesn't have a description of the home. Like it doesn't say that it's crumbling, it doesn't say that it's made of wood or brick, but I think it's notable that some of the other articles that are more vague about this woman's full name and the location of the home, they also seem to describe something other than the house that was there. And you could say that maybe they were respecting this woman's wishes because it sounds like she did want privacy and secrecy. And so maybe the New York Times had more scruples than the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. And who knows, maybe they even changed the description of the home so that it couldn't be recognized. Like maybe it wasn't just for artistic dramatic effect. But I thought this was worth mentioning. I am sort of more inclined to believe this article than some of the other more sensational ones. It's also, yeah, it's just a very matter-of-fact article. There's also an article from the Brooklyn Times Union, also published November 22nd, 1934, that gives the address of the home and Sheehan's first name. It mentions the home of Mrs. Anna Sheehan at 30-35 31st Street, Astoria. It also lists... Carrington's address at 20 West 58th Street in Manhattan. And it also gives the Sicilian man's name. It's one of the few articles that, maybe the only article that I found that gives his name. It just calls him Mr. Basulka. Doesn't give his first name. But again, I think it's really notable that the articles with practical details, like the address, like Sheehan's first name, are also less embellished than the ones that give no real details or fewer details and are embellished in a way that sounds like maybe it's incorrect. As far as I can tell, no gold was ever found at this home. And the closing line of the Brooklyn Times Union article closes this up pretty nicely. Whether there is gold or ghosts in the Astoria home will probably remain a mystery because Mrs. Sheehan's big police dog does not like visitors. That's the story of the Astoria Ghost and Gold House. I wish it was still standing, because it was a really nice-looking house. But this is New York, and if something can be torn down and replaced with a large apartment building, it will be. So before I sign off, I did want to mention something that I talk about a lot on this podcast, which is the power plants of Astoria. I know I've talked about this extensively on a bunch of different episodes, especially episodes that deal with the Queen's waterfront, in particular the Astoria waterfront. Astoria produces 50% of the electricity that's used by New York City, and the air quality here is really, really bad. It's called Asthma Alley, and a lot of people live near these huge power plants that are just emitting really harmful particulate matter and, you know, fossil fuel pollution. Funnily enough, I know I've mentioned these power plants in the context of looking at cemeteries in Astoria because there's at least two family cemeteries that used to exist in Astoria and are now the sites of power plants. The Blackwell Family Burial Ground, which is where the Ravenswood plant is now, 
the Ravenswood Generating Station, I believe it's called. That's right by the bridge to Roosevelt Island. And then there was the Berrien Cemetery, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head, which is at the power plant in northern Astoria. A company called NRG, which is a multinational, multi-billion dollar company that has been polluting Astoria for a very long time. They are trying to have a new peaker plant built using fracked gas, and that's not good. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for our lungs here in the neighborhood. And it's just really short-sighted to be building a new fossil fuel plant. There's been a big push in this area to build out infrastructure for renewable energy, which is both better for the environment and also doesn't give people respiratory illnesses. And of course, if you're building a new plant that uses fossil fuels, you're locked into that for a long time, right? That's a big output of capital, you're not going to suddenly replace it with something that is green and good for the environment. I also know that NRG has been trying to drum up support for this power plant because I've seen my neighbors receive flyers from NRG kind of bragging about how great this new power plant is going to be because, you know, it pollutes slightly less than the current plant pollutes. So, you know, it'll just kill you a little slower. Seems good. So right now the public comment period is open. I believe that NRG was able to skip the environmental review and community approval stages because they used an old plan from like 2010. So there's been a lot of organizing to try to stop this this new plant. So anyway, if you want to know more about this issue, if you want to leave a comment during this public comment period, you can check out publicpower.nyc slash stopnrgplant. And if you want to follow this issue more closely, I'd recommend following Zoran Mondami on social media. He is the assembly member for this area or New York. And his Instagram handle is Z-O-H-R-A-N-K-M-A-M-D-A-N-I. And He's been posting a lot of stories and stuff about this issue and what people can do to help. And again, you can check out publicpower.nyc slash stopnrgplant for more info as well. And that's it for this time. You can check out the show notes with all of my sources for this at buriedsecretspodcast.com. You can email me at buriedsecretspodcast at gmail.com. You can follow me on Instagram at Buried Secrets Podcast. If you liked this, please tell your friends about it. Please rate and review on whatever podcatcher you use. And thanks so much for listening.